Um, and now we're going to move into communion. So over to Mark. Good. Okay. Um, so is everyone set to go? You've got your bread and you've got your wine. Great. Okay. So we'll come to the time of worship where we're going to share communion. So why do we have communion? We've been having it every week. So in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, Jesus says to take the bread and the wine or grape juice and do it in remembrance of him. So we're doing it, <clears throat> pardon me, to remember what Jesus has done. And also in verse 25, it mentions that this is the new covenant. This is the new agreement that God has made on the basis of Jesus' death. Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, it also tells us to examine ourselves before we have communion. So we're just going to spend just a moment to just come before God and ask his forgiveness for anything of the past week that you feel that hasn't been quite right. So let's just spend a few moments doing that. So now if we just hold, I don't know if you've got a biscuit or matzos, if you can just hold the biscuit and the wine, just hold it in your hand and just look at these, these symbols of Christ's body and blood. And let's just think about what Jesus really went through for us. Just as you look at them. Think about the immense love that he has for you. For the forgiveness he gives you. And just how great his love for you and me and humanity is. That he gave his life. And he suffered so horribly. And, you know, he did this knowing how imperfect we are, how sinful we are, but he died for you and me. And it is through Jesus that we can be forgiven. So he made this pathway for us through the shedding of his blood. So... We're about to take communion together and I'm just going to pray. Jesus, we just want to thank you that your love for us was so great. And Lord, we do this in remembrance of what you did for us, that you have made the pathway to God the Father. And we just thank you. Thank you that you did this for each one of us. So now let's take the bread and the wine together. Thank you, Mark. That's really great. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity now to introduce our speaker for today, uh, for those that were here earlier, I think most of you have had a chat with him, but um, I'll introduce him anyhow. So um, this is Dr. Ashley Crane, not to be confused with Dr. Fraser Crane, sorry, had to do it. <laughs> for those that happen to like that show, it was one of my favourites. So um, when Jenny first recommended that we go with Dr. Crane, she, she read out his bio um, and in the end of the bio, it says this, that he's a Messianic Jew from Western Australia and he likes motorbikes. And I said, Jenny, you should have started with that. That's all that matters. <laughs> but apart from that, I mean, that, that should be enough, right? So, okay, over we go. So apart from that, I'll give you a little bit more. 
Um, so Dr. Crane has been in ministry since 1979. Um, I was out of nappies then, but I just uh, received his uh, doctorate from Murdoch University, uh, which is in WA. He's pastored five different churches, um, mainly Messianic churches. Um, he's also been the principal of the Harvest West Bible College, um, as well as a senior lecturer there. Um, and he's now part of the ministry team at Celebrate Messiah. Um, and I believe that's probably where, where we found him or where Jenny found him because of the links through to Celebrate Messiah there. Um, and there's all kinds of other things, but I just thought I'd give you a little bit of the background. So, Dr. Crane, we're so happy to have you with us. Um, let me just pray for your message and I'll hand over. Lord, thank you for the chance to hear... Uh, the wisdom and inspiration that you have placed in the heart and in the mind of uh, Dr. Crane. Um, and Lord, give us ears to hear, um, give us a mind to understand, give us a spirit to be filled, a heart to be filled with whatever it is that you want us to know, to feel, to, to get from today. Um, and Lord, plug up the other ear so that it doesn't fall out so that it sinks into our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, over to you, Dr. Gray. Oh, thanks very much, Jonathan. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share with you today. Um, I uh, hopefully be able to bring a message to you. I'm more of a teacher than a yell, scream preacher. So hopefully be able to bring something across to you that uh, you can put in your hearts. So if you want to, at the top right hand of your screen, click on the speaker view, that will help you be able to see me more and more what I'm going to share with you. But I'd like to start, if I can, with two scripture verses from out of the book of Acts, and I'm going to do my share screen here. And hopefully uh, not, um, um, oh, here we go. Um, on the share screen, I want to talk about the season of Pentecost that we find ourselves in uh, now. Um, says there in the scriptures for john immersed with water but you will be immersed with the holy in a few days you'll be immersed with the holy spirit acts chapter 1 actually verse 8 not verse 5 you will receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and to the ends of the earth and then that one that you should all know out of acts chapter 2 uh verses 1 to um 1 to 4 uh, it says there, on the, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were seating. And then what looked like tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues just as the Spirit enabled them to speak. So a very powerful passage, and we pray, Lord, that you'd help us be able to understand this uh, in a deeper way after today's session. So we are in the season of, of uh, Pentecost, Shavuot on the Hebrew calendar, one of the greatest events for both Jewish and Christian calendars. At Pentecost, we remember two birthdays, two brides, two gifts that happen on two different mountains, 1,500 years apart all designed to build God's covenant communities. Uh, the, the, the first is the birth of the church uh, uh, as God's bride. Uh, sorry, birth of, of Israel as God's bride and with the gift of God's word on Mount Sinai. So uh, again, some of you may not have uh, realized how connected all of this is. Um, I will uh, try to share screen here again, just to keep you flowing with where we're at. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to still keep up with it. Um, technical difficulties here on, on the one hand. So uh, again, the realm of the ability to uh, have uh, two uh, things happening at the one event. Uh, gift of the uh, birth of Israel as is God's bride, the gift of God's word that happened on Mount Sinai. And then 1,500 years later, the birth of the church as the bride of Christ with the power of gift of the Holy Spirit on Mount Zion. But to understand Acts chapter 2, we've got to go back to the first Pentecost. And the first Pentecost happened all the way back uh, in Exodus chapter 19 and chapter 20. And unfortunately, for the sake of time, we won't be able to uh, go and, and read all of these scripture verses. 
But uh, Exodus chapter 19 and 20 tells us how they, God led them out of the land of Egypt and God gives Moses his word uh, and his commands of Mount Sinai. This is considered the first Pentecost, where Israel's birth as a nation becomes God's bride at Mount Sinai. When you hear about the church being the bride of Christ, is actually built on Israel being the bride of God. Moses, Israel, is given the gift of the Ten Commandments uh, there on Mount Sinai and as part of a marriage contract with God. And these Ten Commandments later expanded into all of God's instructions to cover all the Bible. On Mount Sinai, we find the presence of fire and the, uh, of the Holy Spirit, the sounds, the signs of wonders, the extent that people thought Moses actually burnt up. They thought he'd been consumed by the fire of God. Well, he had in a way because he received the commands of God. And God's gift of his word empowers the bride of Israel to know how to worship God and how to serve God and how to reflect God out into their world. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, a summary of that is, if you obey my word, if you obey Torah, then God will keep his covenant of love with you. But there was a problem. Israel's uh, word that was given to them was written on two tablets of hard, unyielding stone outside the body, the heart and the mind. And secondly, God's word was then locked away inside the Ark of the Covenant, inside the temple, uh, in the Holy of Holies, where only one high priest once a year came to visit on the Day of Atonement. But at the same time, within all this whole passage of receiving God's word, the second thing we have to remember uh, uh, with uh, uh, Shavuot, the second thing we remember is the um, sharing of uh, God's Holy Spirit. God wants us to have his Holy Spirit. And we remember the gift of the Spirit here at, uh, at, at Pentecost. Uh, God manifests, first of all, to Israel. And a pillar of fire as he led Israel, God's bride, out of the land of Egypt to Mount Sinai. The Holy Spirit was personally manifested to Israel in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the Shekinah fire of the Holy Spirit. Always keep that in mind. Uh, the fire of God is the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that uh, uh, Exodus chapter 40 and verse 38, uh, we have a public display of the pillar of fire uh, by night and the cloud by day that stands above the tabernacle. The presence of the Holy Spirit so strong at the dedication of the tabernacle uh, uh, of Moses that Moses wasn't even able to enter in because of the presence of the Holy Spirit there. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 to 12, 10 and 11, it tells us that in the dedication of the temple, the glory of the Holy Spirit again so filled the temple that the priests couldn't stand. They kept on falling over under the power of the Holy Spirit all the way back there uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the book of Kings. The public sign is that God is in this house, not that we go by feelings. I don't know about you. Sometimes I get a bit frustrated. People say, well, just feel the presence here today. I want to see the presence of God. I want to see the manifestation of the presence of God by physically seeing God move in our midst. So hopefully you are like that as well. But, and unfortunately, so often there's a but. And the but comes into the realm that... Uh, um, uh, with, with the but here is that God's Ten Commandments, the Holy Spirit also reflected uh, into a ball of fire above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. Again, where only one high priest once a year gets to enter there and share the Shekinah of glory. So both God's word is locked away in the Ark of the Covenant and then God's Holy Spirit is their presence, a ball of fire above the mercy seat. But again, only in the Holy of Holies where only one high priest once a year gets to see. This is not God's ideal. He wants to personally relate with to more than just one person once a year. God desires to be close to us. God desires that he would be working close with his covenant partners and empower us to do the God thing in our world. God wanted more. God's and humans needed more. Fourthly, unfortunately, with all of this, uh, the loss of the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament reveals that tumultuous relationship with Israel cycled around from keeping God's word to breaking God's word, to go back keeping his word, to breaking his word. Israel worshipped the Lord, but they also worshipped uh, other gods. They disobeyed by worshipping other gods. Sounds a bit like the church. We say we worship God, then we do other non-God things. We should be focused on our full worship of God in our lifestyle. 
And then tragically, the Davidic dream becomes a nightmare. And in that nightmare, the Davidic dream happened because tragically and sadly, we find that the uh, um, uh, glory of God, the spirit of God departs from the house of God. And we find that uh, uh, the, 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 the spirit rises up from the temple and departs from there publicly entered into the tabernacle, publicly entered into the temple of Solomon, but all also saw him publicly leave the temple as a public display of coming in and a public display of going out. Israel is sent to Babylon, tragically. And there in Babylon, praise God, they repent. And they're brought back into the land that God promised them. The J Jerusalem's rebuilt, the second temple's rebuilt, and, and everything is looking glorious. However, there is another further problem in that with all of these things that the, um, the, the presence of God is, is, is not found manifest in the second temple. As glorious as what it was, and as glorious as what uh, Herod rebuilt that second temple, there's no record of the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah of glory, coming back into the temple. Again, so often like churches nowadays have all the uh, ceremony, but no presence of God, no manifestation of God as the power of the Holy Spirit. Israel said they're incomplete as the people of God without the active presence of God's spirit. The bride of God was without the presence of her husband. And Israel looked for a Messiah, someone who would return the spirit of God back to Israel to fill up the purpose of Israel. And we fast forward through time into the New Testament, enter Yeshua, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, who returns the Holy Spirit back into Israel. And that brings us up to our passage here in Acts chapter 2. The biblical story of that first Pentecost sets the scene for what's now going to happen on Mount Zion. Yeshua, Jesus said he was leaving. He was going back to his father. And uh, now for the followers to wait in Jerusalem until they empower the Holy Spirit. Those were the passages that we read beforehand. The passages that we have uh, from... Um, Sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button here. Um, uh, the passages that uh, we read uh, beforehand about being immersed in the Holy Spirit, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Cain's when they're all there in the one place and we're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is an important thing to keep in mind because we need to ask the question as to where were they? The Holy Spirit comes there uh, on Mount Zion and fills them up again. And I'm going to probably step on a few uh, uh, um, 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 sacred cows at the moment. But again, sacred cows can make the best hamburgers. So uh, I hopefully at the end of this, you'll be able to find something more substance with what I'm going to say than some of the traditional things. Because when it says they're all in one place, people say, where was it? Chapter two, verse two says they were there in the house where they were sitting. And it's often traditionally, traditionally interpreted as being the upper room. But the upper room is actually a place that's taken from chapter one of Acts, verse 11, where it says that the 12 went back to the upper room where they were staying. The upper room is actually a granny flat. If you look at that picture in the very middle, if you can see at the very top, that's an upper room in a building in Jerusalem. It's a granny flat. It's only there as a small room to hold enough people there as a bedroom. It wouldn't have been able to hold all those present at the time of the book of Acts. Chapter 2, verses 12, uh, verse 13 and 15 says that they were exhibiting drunken-like behavior that everybody observed. In other words, they were falling down under the power of the Holy Spirit, just as Moses and the priest uh, back in the days when the Holy Spirit came into the tabernacle and then into the temple. Now we find this manifest here in the book of Acts in the same way as with the tabernacle, the same way the temple. Now the followers of Jesus were falling down, stumbling around, uh, stammering with other tongues that they couldn't recognize immediately. These are the same signs that means the same Holy Spirit. In other words, God's back in the house. 
God's there in the house. The presence of God has come back to Israel, visiting his bride again. If they're falling, by the way, under the power of the Holy Spirit, who's going to be able to navigate down those stairs? I don't know if you can see the picture there. Those some more narrow stairs uh, don't have guardrails there a lot of times in Israel. Uh, you wouldn't want to be navigating down there if you're under the power uh, of the Holy Spirit where you're stumbling around everywhere. It would be a quick way down those stairways and then navigating through the narrow streets in Jerusalem. You wouldn't do that. However, if you read in the scriptures carefully, it doesn't say that the followers of Jesus went to the crowds. It actually tells us that the crowds went to where the, where the people were. So the crowds gathered to the followers of Jesus, not the other way around. In chapter 2, verse 17, it tells us that women and young were present. So it had to be a large place where genders, both genders and all ages could be gathered. And chapter 2, verse 41 tells us that after Peter finished preaching, over 3,000 people believed. And there's only one place in Jerusalem large enough for over temple for people of crowds of over 3000 to accept and receive Jesus as their lord and that is God's house which is the temple and the most likely place where this manifestation of acts chapter 2 happened and we'll get to why this is important in a moment is because it would have been gathered in Solomon's porticos if you look in the picture I've shown there around the edges of of the temple of Solomon sorry, Temple of, uh, of, of Herod, they had these Solomon's porticos were built there and they were teaching there in houses. By the way, in the Old Testament, often the temples called God's house. And did they people gather in these places? Yes. Luke chapter 4, 24, verse 53, it says they waited in the temple for the return of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 46 says they continued daily in the temple. Acts chapter 5, verse 12, they're all with one accord in Solomon's portico. So it states that directly that's where they were located in Acts chapter 5. And scholars today believe that this is where Jesus' followers were. In Acts chapter 2, they were praying in Solomon's porticos. All the people gathered there in between those pillars, there in those houses where the rabbis would teach their lessons. And they were waiting for Jesus' promised empowerment of the Holy Spirit so they could go out and transform their world. Now, I've been there. You've got my picture behind me here of the, of the Western Wall. Right up above the Western Wall is that exact area where I've been up there, I lead tours to Israel, and I've been up there and taken people up there, and there's this massive area up there, it's right by the southern steps, where they would have walked up the southern steps to enter into that area, and it would have easily fit the 3,000 that it speaks about there. So now we find that the Holy Spirit returns back to Israel in Acts chapter 2. Not privately, and this is where the important thing, I want to get you to, to really have this encounter and understand. Not privately to a granny flat, but a public display of power into the Holy of Holies, into the holy place where it departed from in Ezekiel. So keep that in mind. That is so important to remember. From where it departed from in Ezekiel now comes back to that same area. But the Holy Spirit did not re-enter into the traditional Holy of Holies, hidden away where only one high priest once a year gets to experience on the Day of Atonement. But now the Holy Spirit enters in the followers of Jesus, making them into being a new living Holy of Holies. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it says, all of them present receive. So not just the leaders, but sons, daughters, young, old, even the servants receive the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the presence of the Holy Spirit comes back to them, uh, again, in a public way, not hidden away, cloistered away in an upper room somewhere where they went out to speak about it, but publicly the power of God's manifested in front of everybody. So 3,000 people sitting back there going, oh my goodness, look at this. What is this that's happening? And come over and after receiving the explanation from Peter, they, we want to have part of that too. We want to accept Jesus. We want to receive the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So now it fulfills Jeremiah 31, 31, where it talks about and uh, now that the word of God's going to be on the heart and upon the mind. Ezekiel 36, where it talks about giving a new heart, a new spirit, take out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. 
Now the word of God is on the two tablets, not hard stone, but of mind and heart, not locked away, but publicly manifested out into our world. Now it's a public manifestation and the power of the spirit has been returned back to Israel. The sounds of Mount Zion, of the rushing wind, the presence of fire reminds everybody of that first Pentecost that was on Mount Sinai. So now we have a second Pentecost, a full manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The significance of this for you and for us today is so important because it's a whole concept of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are now the temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Not locked away in a, uh, a building in Jerusalem, but now in you, enabling you to go out and transform your world. Pentecost, two birthdays, the birthday of Israel as the nation of God and that of the church of the people of God. And two brides, the Israel being the bride of God and the church being the bride of Christ. Two gifts, that of the word of God, that of the spirit of God on two mountains, first at Mount Sinai, 1500 years before, and then later at Mount, uh, uh, Mount Zion to receive the both word and the spirit, not on the outside, but now on the inside. God's supernatural power, God's Holy Spirit, where he always intended to be, and that is inside you. Now the Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to live out and be the word of God to everybody. That's why we're now the, the place of God. So no longer the world coming to Jerusalem, but now Jerusalem going into the world. The church continues. East Lake Church continues because you are the church, not the building. You are the church. You're able to go out into your world. So what's the uh, significance of all this? Well, thank you for asking. Let's just focus in on that for the moment. And in conclusion, this is what I want to come in. You are now God's temple. You are empowered with the Holy Spirit. You are the Holy of Holies. You are the one who's out to move in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And you are to bring heaven down to change your world. Too many people say, God, come and fix this mess. God's saying, I'm trying to. I'm trying to do it through you. You step up as God's partner in the power of the Holy Spirit. You live out God's Holy Spirit. You live out the word. You live out the gifts. You live out the fruit of the Holy Spirit given on Pentecost. You take the Spirit out into the marketplace as God's covenant partner to transform your world in the realm of a public manifestation, not secretly done, but publicly done. You are to be the royal priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. It says there, 1 Peter chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 7. You are to be Jesus' church so that the authority of Hades will not overcome you. Remember, if God's in his house, then you can't be destroyed. So keep those in mind. This is what God's calling you to be. You are to be God's partner in all things. You are to be the one to make it happen, to partner with God, to build his kingdom here on earth and in your world, to break through with supernatural power for your life and the lives of those around you. The gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, to show that God is in his house, to experience miracles daily in our life. That's what God wants us to do, where the supernatural becomes natural in that you are to be now God's place where miracles happens in your world. You are God's partner. You are the one that God's calling to make it happen. So I want to leave that there with you and park it there. And uh, if we're going to have discussion groups, the question that I would appreciate or offer to you to discuss, where and how can you live out the active presence of the Holy Spirit in your world, because you're the one who makes God happen into your world by you stepping out in faith in the realm of the Spirit. Abba, Father, we ask that you would put this word into our heart so we can uh, just understand your word, live out your word, and be able to be your word, be your spirit out into our community. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jonathan. Back to you.